All right, that is another semester done and another set of modules to review. This time around, we've got six of them EE2022 Electrical Energy Systems, EE2023 Signals and Systems, EE2211 Introduction to Machine Learning, CDE2000 Creating Narratives, EG2501 Livable Cities, and LAJ2203 Japanese 4. Take this video as my own opinion on all the different modules that I'm going to review, and you know, don't just listen to my opinion, do, do your own diligent research to prepare for upcoming modules. We'll start off with the engineering mod EE2022, Electrical Energy Systems. This module is all about the energy grid, how power gets from power plants to homes and businesses. We'll learn about all the components from synchronous generators to transformers to power lines and induction models as a load. To make calculations more difficult, there are three phase power systems, which is basically three different single phase systems, the normal circuits that you're used to seeing, Left into one, there's cost savings and a little bit more power efficiency through that. To make it worse, there is two different configurations for this, delta and y for all the components. But with everything that makes calculations more difficult, there are also things that makes calculations more simple. Engineers really like simple stuff after all. There is per unit analysis, which makes calculations across different voltage segments universal. So let's just say, for example, a load on the business side has a power unit of 0.8, whatever it is. And... On the generator side, it will be the same 0.8 PU, but the values will differ depending on what you're looking at. There is power factor as well, which adds in a factor of imaginary power when we are dealing with inductors and capacitors. And to end the module, there's one more chapter on calculating the cost of energy based on different pricing schedules. You have to memorize every single bit of information from this module, since it is a closed book assessment without any cheat sheets to help you out. Fortunately though, the concepts are simple enough to grasp, and most of the complex formulas will be given to you. The main idea is for you to use those formulas given to you correctly, which is a tall task for some people, I'll admit. The main issue comes in conversions. If you're not dealing with per unit analysis, there is a lot of conversions in this module. There is one between RMS and maximum values, there is one between three phase and single phase systems, there is one on Y connections and Delta connections, and there is one between the different voltage segments, depending on your transformer's turns ratio. There are a few more of these different conversions, and there are different rules, and you have to memorize every single one of it, which kind of makes this module a bit more difficult. First and twice a week with tutorials when the chapter is finished. We had ours at Engineering Auditorium, which had power plugs at most, if not all, seats meaning you don't have to worry about your computer running out of juice. Do note that you should come to all of the lectures and tutorials since there are no recordings at all. Good luck with that. In addition to all of that, there is also one lab session on transformers and power factors in the last few weeks, which is really quite simple if you know what you're doing. We chose from a list of time slots available and worked in pairs with only a few pairs in each session using physical electrical equipment like power generators, circuit machines, transformers, and multimeters. It really is quite fun and a break from doing just normal paper exercises day in and day out. Touching electrical equipment is fun, really. Except for the spaghetti monsters of wires. Regarding the exams for EE2022, they are easier in comparison to the modules that we'll go through next, EE2023. But still, it is no slouch. Many people will fall prey to simple mistakes in calculation and conversions, so check through your papers and make sure that you come prepared. Now, regarding the use of calculators in the exams, your Texas Instrument graphic calculator is a no-go since programmable calculators are not allowed during the exams, and your trusty Casio FX96SG Plus can't deal with imaginary numbers. So, get yourself a Casio ClassWiz. Now, moving on to EE2023 Signals and Systems. It actually starts off quite tame, but it gets complicated really, really fast. The main point of this module is to learn about Fourier and Laplace transformations and how to work with them. Same as E2022, the module has classes twice a week, with tutorials coming whenever a chapter is finished. Don't ignore the tutorials. This module is very math heavy and really involves a lot of practice. So if you have any doubts that you want to clarify, the tutorials are the perfect chance to do so. Now, there are recordings for this module that is available. But for my batch, they are from the semester before us. So by the time that you are taking this module, things might have changed and your mileage may vary. There were four assignments given to us in this module. Normally, there are three. 
The first one is a math assignment given at the start to get you back up to speed on complex power calculations and phases. There's a signals assessment to test your knowledge on foreign transforms, uh, signal sampling and replication, and a systems assignment towards the end of the semester for Laplace transforms, oscillatory systems, damping, and body plots. Trust me, you'll understand what all of these mean when you are, you know, going through that module. We had a fourth one. The professors thought that the midterm results were so horrible that they had to have an additional assignment giving bonus marks after taking into account midterms and finals. Now, we don't know how much weightage this assignment holds, but we don't need to know. The professors will decide on it later. If you're wondering how terrifying the midterms were, here's how it is. While there are some engineering gods that got a full 40 marks, most of us were in the 16 to 34 point range with a median of 25. I am part of the median, by the way. There were also some people with zero points. I'm not kidding. Now, I don't know how they got the zero points. Maybe they didn't attend the midterms or they absolutely flunked it. But either way, zero is zero, which, you know, is quite serious. And then came the finals. Oh, the finals. It was an absolute bloodbath. If the exams for EE2022 were bad enough, this is on steroids. If you're not sufficiently prepared, you might not even get half the marks. That's just how difficult it was. Now, to top things off, there is back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back exams for EE2022, EE2023, and EE2211. So you'll be hard-pressed to find time to revise all of them properly. Of course, the recommended way is to continuously study all of the topics throughout the weeks as they come, and also start to prepare things a month ahead of time. But with all of the projects and presentations that are leading up to recess week, that is a rather difficult task. Which brings us to our next module, EE2211, Introduction to Machine Learning. It really is just a bit of coding and a lot of logic. The basis of machine learning is to train a piece of code based on existing data and let it accurately approximate a new set of data or to give some unlabeled data and then it sort everything out. Every couple of weeks, you'll learn a new technique and each lecture will build upon the last. Now, with 13 weeks of lessons and a lot of code, you might think that it will be a bit difficult to memorize all of them. Which, well, it is. But worry not, it is open internet and you can just look through all of the notes and compile all of the code into a single file for your convenience. You will actually have to use some of the code during exams to solve a few problems. Overall, the time investment for this module is not too heavy if you're just browsing through the notes and putting all the different snippets of code together into one file. And practice also doesn't take that long either, as the code can run pretty fast. I know of some modules where the compilation takes upwards of an hour, but this is not one of them. The concepts will become quite straightforward as you learn them throughout the weeks, so you don't have to worry too too much about this module. It is an introductory course after all. Now that we're done with all of the engineering modules, it's time for the presentation-heavy modules. Starting off with CD2000, Creating Narratives. Now, most students think that this is a fluff mod, but considering that many companies say that our engineering interns are just horrible at doing presentations, this might just be the solution that NUS has come up with. This module is a continuous assessment module where we have to pick up an artifact or product that can solve a problem of our choosing and present it to the class and the professors. Now, you don't have to worry too much about finding a problem-solution pair, as the ideas will be better, and suggestions will be given if the idea is too hard to present or not compelling enough. There are three assessments in total for this module. The first one is a TED Talk style presentation with a slide count and presentation time limitation. This forces you to get creative and think a little bit out of the box. Now, the second assessment is linked to the third one, where we have to prepare an A1 poster and an A4 brochure to use as presentation aid and we have to send it to our classmates for critique. They'll send one back and you'll have to critique it in a 500 word essay. The third assessment is a final presentation using the completed poster and brochure as aid. Do note that the printing of the poster and the brochure will not be paid for by NUS. You have to do it yourself at approximately $12. The workload for this module is not that heavy, with one sole exception, poster and brochure making. If you're even any bit decent in using Canva or PowerPoint, then you should be able to pump it out within one weekend. If graphic design is not your passion, then maybe a week or two in between lessons. Speaking of lessons, the lessons for this module are bite-sized videos found on Canvas. There are tutorials, which are much more useful as the professors will be around to guide you through the frameworks for whatever you're going to do. Overall, there's not really much to talk about this module. It is just a speaking module to improve our presentation skills. That's the whole point. 
Now we'll be moving on to another presentation module that is a bit more involved. EG2501 Livable Cities. For JC people, this is essentially a mini PW. You'll be assigned to a group randomly and you have to work on a district that is also randomly assigned. There are five districts that are the focus of this module. The task is to find a problem, come up with one or a few integrated solutions, and use frameworks like cost-benefit analysis and Leopold matrices to assess the solution's feasibility. All of this is through three presentations culminating in a final one with an industry guest sitting in. Each presentation has its own set of deliverables, notably with the final presentation having a video component. Regarding the time commitment required for this module, well, it is quite high. The nature of coming up with a solution for a given area means that you'll have to go down there at least once. So if you're an east sider given the area of Jurong East, or a west sider given east coast, then well, good luck with that. Now, a good amount of time will also be spent on making the video, be it from on-site filming, to creating artist impressions of your solutions, to video editing, which I will be doing later for this video. The presentations don't need to be overly formal. In fact, you can be really creative with it as long as you know you meet the requirements and don't be overly offensive. Some students might think of this as a fluff mod, well, it might indeed be a fluff mod, but I personally think that it is an interesting experience learning about all the areas and Singapore in general. The reports which are published by the Centre for Livable Cities, CLC, are open to the public and they have been publishing a lot of different reports for a good couple of years. I didn't know of its existence until this module and probably neither do you until this video, but it is a good read. If you want to know more about the different aspects of Singapore, like housing, urban planning, and conservation, do take some time to read the published reports. I'll be posting the link to all of the reports in the description below. Last but not least, my module of choice, LAJ2203 Japanese 4. First off, compared to Japanese 3, this is a spike in difficulty. Be prepared to see your former 7 to 8 out of 10 quiz course drop down to a 3 to 4 out of 10. For a language course, Japanese is said to be the most time intensive and you can see why that's the case. You'll learn about 150 kanji, further usage of particles, more complex grammar structures, and a few polite expressions, also known as keigo. There are 6 hours worth of lessons every single week with 2 hour lectures and 2 2 hour tutorials. In addition, there'll be weekly quizzes during tutorials, sometimes twice a week, and there will be lecture quizzes as well with the occasional listening quiz. With over 30 words and phrases to learn, every single quiz, the workload will pile up very quickly. The module goes through most of the chapters in Minna no Nihongo 2, leaving the last few chapters for Japanese 5. Come prepared for the tutorials, since you'll be asked to read sentences and do a lot of public speaking in front of the class. For assessments, there are the usual oral and normal thumb tests, but now they come with a twist. Instead of memorizing section C conversations in the textbook for oral, you'll be given a set of prompts that the professors can choose from and just make conversations out of them. There are also additional segments which test your knowledge on what you have learned throughout the course regarding vocabulary and grammar. The term tests are also much more difficult. Instead of giving prompts for what to fill in the blanks in a text, you will have to judge for yourself what words to fill in. There will also be minute differences in the options given in the listening comprehension segment with the determining factor in the audio sometimes just being one single syllable. So if you miss out on a bit of the audio, well, you're on your own. Finally, there is an additional essay segment, and although you've seen it before in Japanese 3, this time round is done on pen and paper, so it was an absolute killer during the term test. Luckily enough, writing in complete hiragana is still accepted. This module really, really tests on your knowledge extensively, and while it is fun learning a new language, especially Japanese, it can also get tiring very quickly with all the other modules that you have to take especially if you're having very heavy workloads. And that is all for the modules that I took this semester. Hopefully this will help to somewhat prepare you for the modules if you're taking them sometime down the road. Again, this is just my opinion and feelings on the modules. If you disagree with what I've said, feel free to write them down in the comment section below. If you also want to share your own experiences, do so too. Like if you find this helpful, subscribe if you haven't already, and as always, thank you so much for watching.